you again for your patience. Um, really appreciate that you um, waited all this time. We had an, an IT issue, ma managed to get it uh, resolved now. A uh, bit of a housekeeping uh, before we start. Uh, please post your questions during the session in uh, the using the Zoom's uh, Q&A function rather than uh, posting your questions on the chat. Um, Richard and Michelle uh, are going to have a very interesting conversation on uh, flexibility um, and um, will allow some uh, time uh, at the end of this session um, for you to uh, ask your questions and then uh, Richard and uh, Michelle will be very happy to answer these questions. So the title of this uh, seminar is Flexibility, uh, Wind, Wind Systems Designed for Uncertainty. And uh, our speakers today is Professor Richard De Newfield from MIT and Michelle Carden from Imperial College uh, London. So a uh, brief of an, a bit of an overview. Um, so Michelle uh, has an international career being uh, formerly an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore for eight years. He has a, a teaching experience in data science, optimization, economics and finance for systems design. Um, he did his PhD in MIT as well as his MSc. His, the research topics um, of interest are systems design and optimization, flexibility in design, real options, quantitative finance, machine learning, and uncertainty and risks analysis. And he has worked in uh, the energy sector, uh, transportation and space systems. Um, she is the lead of the strategic engineering lab, which explores and validates new data-driven optimization, AR and VR, VR, and machine learning processes for value-enhanced uh, system design and develops decision-making technologies to tackle tomorrow's global challenges, focusing on uncertainty, sustainability, and resilience. And uh, we're again grateful to have with us uh, Professor Richard De Newfield with a career in engineering systems analysis and design and uh, he is the author of uh, four texts with an application specialty on airport planning design management and with consulting experience on all inhabitant continents he's the founding chairman of mit technology and policy program a model for programs at delft and cambridge and he has uh, served um, in sabbaticals and faculty, faculty posts in, uh, in Europe, such as UK, France, Portugal, Switzerland, Australia, Japan, Singapore, but also in California. And he is a White uh, House fellow for the US uh, President Johnson. His uh, focus has been on flexibility in engineering design. One of my, if uh, I should say, my uh, favorite textbook that uh, greatly influenced my PhD. And, uh, other recent books include an application in, uh, to real estate development. And uh, uh, his investigation includes issues and demonstrations uh, uh, by uh, example applications across engineering pro projects such as uh, uh, transportation, um, airports, and housing developments. So uh, without further ado, uh, please uh, welcome uh, Richard and Michelle. So, Ilias, um, can you hear me? All oh, right. Yes. So, mm -hmm. who is going to be um, moving the slides? Are you? I will. I will, Richard. I'm sharing on my screen. So, okay. please tell me when you want to move on to the next well, slide. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So, thank you, everybody, for your patience. Those of uh, for the delay, we were here, but somehow the technology wasn't. So, I want to start off with the idea that we're talking about flexibility, uh, the ability to uh, alter and adjust designs to accommodate what is really happening in the future over the lifetime of the project, and uh, in, in an uncertain environment. And I wanna emphasize this point, that the future really is unknown. We do not know really what we will need in uh, 10, 20, or 30 years. 
think of uh, what's been happening in the UK context, for example. There has been Brexit, there has been um, the uh, pandemic, there has been the war in Ukraine, the prices of this and that go up, and in general, uh, we do not know what the future is going to bring. And let me talk about a particular small example, but a, a particular example, which is uh, the design of hospitals. Now, the whole medical treatment is in uh, tech large technological flux. Uh, there are fewer babies uh, relatively than there used to be. There are many more uh, hip replacements. Uh, people are living longer. The kind of uh, facilities required in hospitals and the bed days that people have are changing uh, dramatically over time. We simply do not know what's going to happen. So in this context of not knowing what the future will bring, in this context of what I like to say is the future, the forecast is always wrong. That is, using our best guesses of what they bring, we don't hit the mark very well in general. So the first win is that instead of building for the next 30 years, uh, according to some forecasts, it's smarter to build smaller with less capability at the beginning. Why is this better? It provides insurance against overbuilding that perhaps the large facility that, might, that you thought might have been useful for 30 years really isn't needed, that there's a new technology or a new approach or there's different levels of demand that occurred. So it's a uh, building smaller is an insurance against overbuilding. It's also insurance against lock in to old technology. Do we really want in 30 years to be stuck with a 30 year old technology which has been completely outdated um, uh, by developments? And furthermore, we have to recognize that when we, even if we were to build exactly what we had planned on it initially, if we build it later on, when we build it later on, we defer costs. We, uh, on an economic basis, make it cheaper because the present value of future cost is very much smaller than the current cost now. So there are all kinds of reasons that it is clever, desirable, economical, smart to build smaller and less capable at the beginning, um, so long as you have the ability to adjust the capability and the size and the function uh, to future needs. So the second win is that if you delay your final design decisions until when it's actually needed, you can have things at the right time, in the right size, the right technology, and catering to the right needs. So the question is why gamble with an unknown future? Now, Michelle, if you'd go to the next slide, please. I want to talk about a particular design here which is the uh, desalting plant for Melbourne, Australia. They had a drought about uh, 15 years ago and decided that they needed the insurance, the capability to have fresh water produced for the sea. Uh, and that's a perfectly fine idea. There's, that's great. And they then decided to build for 30 years ahead. It was designed in 2009 to the forecast of 2039 to need 150 billion gallons, uh, liters uh, capability. And they built it in three modules and you can see those three modules right there. So that was the design and they built it uh, 30 years in advance. Next slide, please. So this was a huge investment, uh, approximately somewhat over 2 billion uh, uh, pounds sterling based on 2009 technology for this kind of osmosis to meet the project needs 30 years ahead. Now, what you can immediately see is that uh, the technological uh, lock-in for 30 years um, is there. And we can also appreciate that this whole technology of desalting, desalination has been progressing so that it's locked into an inefficient design. But moreover, it's you, so the first decade of uh, 50 billion, 48 billion, 50 billion in those three years of dryness, so not at all used in 
2011, 2012, 2015, 2019, and so forth, is that two thirds of the capacity was not needed right away. That is, you have the case where they spent a large amount of money uh, having capacity three times what they actually needed over the decade. And if they had deferred that expense, the present value of it in terms of the opportunity cost was much better. So uh, the flexibility would have deferred costs, saved money and enabled new latest technology. So this is the example that I want to uh, show you in terms of flexibility can be a win-win uh, design um, at lower cost. So that's where we are, are for now. And, and Richard, so since this is a, a conversation, allow me to uh, ask you, isn't it? And this is something I'm sure many people on the, our audience have on their mind. Isn't it usually more expensive to build for flexibility? Isn't there a chance of wasting resources, capacity? Uh, th thank you, Michel. Uh, bring up the next slide, please. So we need to be careful how we think about that because it's clear that, if, that flexibility at some level costs. That, for example, if you build a bridge, such as had been built across the Tagus River and the Hudson River in New York City, and the Tagus is in Lisbon, um, with the strength for a second deck, it's more expensive than a bridge without that strength. So it is clear that if you compare a facility uh, a smaller facility with the capability to expand with one that isn't, it's clearly more expensive. But that's not the right comparison to make. The correct comparison is the design with flexibility to provide for the future as and if needed later on, with the design that actually provides for the future now. That is, you build, for example, a bridge with a full double decking right away, or one that will be, has a capability to be double decked if and when needed and how needed. So the essence of this is that the option to buy uh, future capabilities or sizes or, or capabilities in general is less than buying them all right away. So the correct, co correct comparison is with how do we design for the, how do we deal with the future needs? Do we build it all now, making a gamble on what we will actually need? Or we design it with a capability to expand or change uh, facilities. So coming back, for example, to the desalting plant, we could e simply say, well, we will build the second and third module out of those three. We'll build them later as we originally designed. Or we can build something in its place which has the same kind of capacity but using a more efficient or more up-to-date technology. So the correct comparison about future costs is do you, when you're providing for the future as the responsible design should do, is do you buy the whole thing now or do you simply buy the option to acquire what you need later on? And in that case, the option to buy is less than the option than building it all right away. So my answer to this, that when you're considering the right kind of flexibility, it is on it, it is obvious that it costs less to buy the option than buying the whole thing. So that's where I'd uh, leave it now. But I think I'd like to, at this point, I'd like to switch over to a your thoughts on this, because one of the things that you have done, as I understand, and you'll be telling us, is that you have thought about how flexibility uh, really is a fundamental approach to sustainability and resilience. So share that with us, please, Michael. Yeah. Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. This is a very strong introduction to the topic. And, and one thing that... Um, I'd like to lead this discussion into is that a lot of the work that you did on flexibility and design and that I've certainly contributed also over the last decade, several years now, is this idea that flexibility can improve the expected economic performance of a system and, and 
you and I and, and many other colleagues around the world have demonstrated that in fact, yeah, these ideas of flexibility can lead to significantly different system design. It helps us think about or think differently about how we would design these systems. So taking uncertainty in a way as a, as a way to stimulate creativity and think differently about the system. Um, but a lot of our work is focused on, on the economics, as you know, so trying to make all this more economical, um, more uh, performing from, from, um, from a financial standpoint. But if you take this, uh, this idea, which is actually quite powerful uh, and extend it, um, my view in, in some ways and that I'd like to share with the audience also is that in some ways, this very simple idea can help us embed better sustainability and resilience in systems. So taken from this idea of making better use of economic resources to making better use of material resources as a whole, um, in line with supporting ideas of sustainability, but also in terms of resilience, because if you make a system that is more adaptable, more changeable, reconfigurable to deal with uncertainty and risk, you are in essence addressing one of the fundamental issue with enabling better resilience. So I think, I think we all agree in that context that flexibility in essence helps the system adapt more readily to uncertainty and there are many ways that we can do it. Richard, uh, you highlighted one that has to do, for instance, with deferring your investment or planning for capacity expansion, but every system is different. They all face different types of uncertainties and risks, and there are many strategies that can be embedded. And, and the idea is to really focus on how to embed these strategies in the design, considering the technical engineering details. Uh, so we can plan for switching between different purposes and missions. And we've seen that in many contexts, like the P-52, you could argue, is one that over, over history has been able to adapt to many different purposes and missions as a whole. Expand contract capacity, that's one example that I'm going to use here. Defer your investment, but recognizing the ability to get out of a project that, that is not working according to plan. And all of these are value-enhancing strategies uh, that need to be embedded carefully in the design. And so one thing, one example that I'd like to use to illustrate how these ideas connect with sustainability and resilience is an example of a waste to energy system that I worked um, for a long time when I was in Singapore. So here on the right, you have the diagram of how these systems work. So they essentially take different types of waste and, and treat them. And then at the other hand, uh, you basically get biofuels, you get compost, you get electricity in some cases. So how do we think of an example, a simple example of flexibility in that context could be that, for example, I don't know exactly how much waste capa or, or treatment capacity I'm going to need today. So I'm going to prepare my facility, for example, by buying an additional piece of land, but then preparing the infrastructure to be shared in the future so that I can enable that capacity expansion in the future. And that seems like a simple idea, but it has profound effects on how you will design your system to be able to do that. And when you actually come to need it, then you deploy that additional capacity, right? And so how does that connect with ideas of sustainability and resilience? Well, I would argue that basically one, one reason, of course, is economics. So it helps, as you mentioned, reduce the initial capital cost, so you reduce your exposure to downside risk if you end up not needing the capacity, but it also makes better use of material resources because you don't deploy capacity that you don't need. And that's important for sustainability to avoid potential waste, to avoid potential additional pollutions that could have a certain impact on society uh, on, and, the, and, and the planet as a whole. Um, it's also from a sustainability standpoint, helping you to do better if you're already promoting sustainable or green technologies, but we can discuss that a bit later on. Um, in this context, it also helps you be more resilient. Um, so it helps your system um, reconfigure and adapt to upside opportunities. If there's more demand than where you thought, you can actually take advantage of this, but also protect from downsides and exposure to risks, so potential disruptions. And, and we've done work on this Again, every system is different. Um, every system needs to be carefully considered in that context. <clears throat> so um, 
So, uh, Michel, uh, yes. if I understand you correctly, I'm, are we to understand you correctly, that uh, your point is that being sustainable means that we should be careful about using less, of not committing where we don't have to. And the essence of resilience is having the flexibility to respond uh, easily to changes, to challenges. At the end of the day, aren't you claiming that flexibility is a fundamental underlying approach to sustainability and resilience? Is that, is that what your claim is? Yes. And uh, the, the short answer is yes. This is the idea that I'd like to put forward is that here we have a systems design paradigm that helps us consider these two important concepts, that is uh, sustainability and resilience, in one unifying paradigm, which in my view is quite important. Um, as we know, there's been a lot of discussion uh, over the last decades, especially with what's happening with changing climate, um, especially right now with geopolitical tensions, healthcare emergencies. Um, and so in many ways, yes, I would argue that on the one hand, uh, thinking carefully about designing a system that's more flexible and adaptable will help you be more sustainable on the one hand by making more efficient, better use of resources, reducing pollution, but also improving the performance of systems that are already sustainable. If you think about renewables, helping deploy these in a better, more um, risk um, mitigating way, um, but also in terms of resilience. So being able to enable quicker recovery after the particular disruptions um, and sometimes even getting back the system to better performance than what it was. And so I think that's, that's where the idea resides is that there is so much discussion on both sides of these two principles, a lot of excellent research on both sides. And at the same time, um, this paradigm of flexibility helps us join the two uh, in a consistent, more systematic framework um, and basically helps us focus the design effort and operations. So that is indeed my view, Richard. Yes, very well. And, and I'm sure that our audience is wondering, how do we do this? Um, so I prepared a very short slide here that explains the basic um, systematic process that we have both contributed to developing over the years and effectively a design framework to enable better flexibility that has as one of the important consequences to enable better sustainability and resilience. And typically we start with a system that we know how to design, um, uh, renewable energy plants and so on. And we go through this process, basically having this kind of design as an input and hopefully having a different and better, more sustainable and resilient design after we've gone through that process. And those, the steps that are typically involved and and this is where I think our work, Richard, contributes is in developing the tools that support these different phases. But one of the critical tools is to sit down and identify what are the critical uncertainty sources that affect the performance of that system. Of course, you can't address them all, but you can certainly address enough that will make a significant difference. Then after that is to focus on human creativity. So based on those uncertainty sources, what are the flexible systems design strategies that will help you deal with those uncertainties. Then it's all about a lot of the work I do. How do you optimize these systems under uncertainty? And then at the core, how do you manage this process of bringing together all the stakeholders that are needed to do this? So uh, on this, Richard, I'd like to uh, hand over to you for, uh, for, for the later part. Yes. I. I... I think that we, we should, both Michelle and I are, are agreed, that it's important to think about the process management. That is, the whole purpose of flexibility design is not to have just good ideas, it's to make things happen. And if we, to implement or to help implement things, and the essence of flexibility is you just don't do something now, but you have a way of saying, well, we start with this, but when it's needed, Later on, we will expand, change, do one thing or another. We will uh, alter the system in a way that seems appropriate for the moment. So the essence of flexibility is the ability to have to do the right thing at the right time. Do this in practice requires careful thought. And so we don't want to leave our discussion about flexibility without emphasizing the need to have 
think about how do you get from the starting point to later on. So here are some things that need to be done that you wanna keep the flexibility current. That is, if you have, as Michelle was suggesting, a plot on which you propose to build uh, an addition for a hospital wing or a plant or whatever it might be, you wanna be sure that through zoning and other activities, uh, planning permissions, that you maintain that ability to do it, that it doesn't somehow get changed into a, a, a different status and it's impossible to do. Also, since you want to do your changes, your adaptations at the right time, you need to monitor the situation carefully. And you need to have the capability to implement when it's timely. That means you may have uh, contractors on retainer, that you have up-to-date plans and so forth. In general, flexibility in practice needs a game plan. That is, you need to anticipate the obstacles to impl implementation. The obstacles might be that neighbors don't want to have a new development. The obstacles might be, as in the case of a hospital in Britain that I was working uh, on, that you have built the space to expand a hospital. Uh, that is, you have created a shell in which you can put in the right kinds of equipment depending upon the needs that will happen in the future. For example, more hip replacements or care of older people. Um, but that that you uh, need to be able to actually implement it. And this particular hospital in Britain, operating under the a trust scheme, uh, the bondholders uh, needed to be, to agree to the changes, the changes of finances and everything. And they, they didn't want to do it because it was against their interests. So that uh, you could think that technically you have the ability, but there are social, political, economic, and other um, lines of resistance. So it's important to, in developing a game plan, to share the concepts of the strategy with the potential stakeholders or participants in um, what needs to be happen later on and to get it clear. So um, the use of flexibility requires a lot more than being clever with the analysis. It requires attention to the implementation and what we call a game plan, that is how do you move the pieces on the board um, as you go ahead. So uh, I, I just really think that's an important um, reference uh, that needs to be done, uh, to be made, uh, any discussion about the usefulness of, of flexibility in design. Uh, it may be, uh, now the time to make ourselves available to questions, uh, perhaps. Uh, are you agreed, uh, 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 Michel, or are there things that you would like yes. to add before we transit? Uh, transit? No, absolutely. No, I think I think this is, you've, you've summarized all the key issues as far as I'm concerned. Um, yes, yeah, so Ilias, we're more than happy to open the floor now to a discussion with our audience. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for the uh, um, excellent conversation. Um, yes, we have um, a few questions um, from the audience, and I will please remind you to use the uh, Zoom's Q&A uh, box to post your questions so we make sure we don't uh, uh, miss any of your questions. So the first question is by Noor, I hope I pronounced it correctly. How can we measure the value of flexibility? Any indicators can be used other than economic indicators? I will try my hand at that. Um, that's an excellent question, Noor, um, and thank you for putting it. So the essence of, of the value of flexibility is it what, it what does it add to the performance of the system? Now, uh, I'm presuming that when you're designing a system that you have uh, many indicators of performance. So if I'm designing a hospital, for example, or a school, I want to know something about the financial implications of different approaches. But I also want to think about what the building, what the uh, thing is for. Uh, a hospital is to perform uh, good medicine and to cure people. So I will have at the same time a measures performance in terms of money, but in terms of other matters of performance uh, to the system. 
number of people cured, the uh, ability to be sustainable over time, can it really perform its function adequately because it'll have the right equipment and so forth. So the, uh, the analysis considers, all right, on the base case that M Michelle was talking about with no flexibility, how does the system perform over time under the range of situations that may occur? So that's a distribution of possibilities. Then to compare that with the uh, performance of the system with the flexibility to adjust to the different demands that occur over time. So that uh, uh, you can create tables, for example, you can create graphs, multi-dimensional graphs of how the two systems perform. And there's an art to that. But the simple answer is that you measure performance, not just in terms of the finances and the resources, but in terms of the important issues for why you are building this particular uh, system, designing it and imp implementing it. So it's a multidimensional analysis of comparing with the flexibility over what happens without the flexibility. Thank you for your yeah. thought. I hope that's helpful. And, and if I can add to this, Nor, I would say that historically, it's true that the, the, the theories that we are working on and adapting to make them more applicable in engineering practice are coming from the finance, um, the financial theory and economics. Uh, so there is a connection here as to why um, we focus a lot on the economics, but the beauty of a lot of the research that's currently ongoing is to actually make these tools applicable to other metrics, performance metrics, whether you want to model, for instance, the level of CO2 emissions in your system, or you want to measure the uh, time to emergency response in an ambulance system, for example, those are all now metrics that can be accommodated by the types of models that we develop um, and, and use um, and improve computationally in the research. So yes, all of this is feasible. Thank you both. Um, we have quite a few questions. Uh, we have seven questions open currently, so that's uh, that's really um, it's really interesting. Um, so the next question is by Jonathan Leap. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back to normal. Would you argue that flexible design allow us to not only bounce back but also adapt our infrastructure to work even better, not only absorbing shocks but also adapting to shifts? I'll leave that to you as a start. Um, yes. Uh, no? yes. Please go so, ahead. Um, so that's a very good question, Jonathan. And, and one thing that I should preface here is that a lot of the work that we've done and the community has done on flexibility so far is on what I would say known unknowns. So in some ways, you know, for example, that the demand or the price or will fluctuate over time. You just don't know when, you don't know under what form, right? And so of course, there's always a challenge in trying to plan for something that you don't exactly know what form it's gonna take. It's gonna disrupt the system. You don't know when it's gonna happen and you don't know the impact, our typical black swans, right? Um, and so I would say that there is a lot of efforts trying to see what actually designing systems and trying to foresee, anticipate some of these events. Um, can where flexibility can actually help. Um, and so it's hard to say generally that, yes, um, you know, your system will bounce back, will come back to the same or even better. But at the same time, the key is to consider a different design is trying to address or think differently about your system to prepare it to deal with these shocks. And then after that, this is where you can assess how good potentially that system will deal, for example, through the modeling. But of course, this is a case by case situation. I think it's very difficult to generalize um, that different types of flexibility will always lead to better bounce back or coming back to even better. But it, I mean, so far our studies demonstrate that yes, even if it's a flexibility that you've carefully planned in the system, maybe in response to other types of uncertainties and risks, then even if there's a disruption, something you didn't anticipate, the ability to reconfigure does help you recover some of that pre-disruption performance and, and potentially in some cases, yes, do better. But this is certainly a topic of a very uh, 
exciting investigation of the moment. Thank you both. Um, the next question is by Mohammed uh, El Tanir, who is uh, uh, one of our PhD students. <clears throat> Thank you for your insightful presentation. I am wondering how flexibility strategies can evolve to accommodate a continuous demand that is not limited to 20, 30 years, but more, especially when such facilities will be improved in terms of capability and are much more rigid than what initially were designed for which make things much more challenging. Um, I'll try my hand at that. Uh, Michelle can add to it, I'm sure. Um, so we are talking about very long term now. Um, let's say something like um, um, metro lines through a, through a city, for example, has been recently opened uh, in, in London, um, that there's only so much that you can do, of course, there's limits on it, but there are various things that you can think about saying, all right, uh, we need to accommodate trains uh, that go through. We suppose they might be trains, there might be some other form of transportation, it doesn't have to be steel on steel. Um, and we can think about, all right, how do we think about making it so, for example, that you could have longer platforms. Do you somehow make sure that you have the space to enlarge the platforms as needed? Can you think about different ways to have access and egress them? One of the issues in uh, the London uh, subway uh, the system is that the, uh, they are not designed for old people and there are an awful lot of stairs and uh, walking that makes the transition from one line to another or uh, in and out uh, very difficult. So that you can think about ways in which you can think about that um, and uh, breaking down these possibilities and rigidities. Um, now, there are limits to that, of course, but I think it's important to keep in mind the basic idea that our forecasts are typically wrong, wrong in the sense that what we expect to happen in 30 years is not what will happen for a variety of reasons, and that we should be open to thinking about how do we deal with a potential different futures and seeing if there's some things we can make, we can do to make them more uh, amenable, more sustainable, more flexible. So uh, that's not a very precise answer, but I think it's to keep in mind the uncertainties and to deal with them uh, with an open mind. And I think if I can add to this, Mohammed, I think in the long term, this is where these issues of having a game plan become extremely important. So if you've designed a system that is adaptable, you certainly don't want to lose this capability, even if your project has a 15, 20, 30 years lifetime. This is one of the critical things that need to be embedded in, in, and considered in that game plan. Um, but I'm not sure if the nature of your question was also referring to retrofitting existing building, how to make them flexible. This is certainly um, an important challenge, existing buildings and trying to make them adaptable. Yes, that is true. That would be a significant challenge. And, and there are certainly excellent research about this this topic, um, but I guess here, our, our part of, of our message is to try and think differently about these systems from the get-go, um, um, to basically design these systems from the very start so that they are more adaptable, more reconfigurable, but make sure that you don't lose this capability, lose track of that capability 20, 30 years down the road. So I don't know if that answers your question, but Thanks for asking. Thank you both. Um, a very interesting question by Edgar Mauricio. Many thanks for an interesting discussion on the topic. Something that puzzles me is that, hold on a sec, that flexibility is easy to envis envision within the private sector. However, within the public sector, where the larger investments are made, guarantee the success of a flexible policy in the long term is rather complex in particular due to the short uh, lifetime of governments. What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, my own reaction to this is that uh, we have to be careful about making easy comparisons about the um, uh, 
powers and capabilities of the private sector versus the public sector. It is true that governments change, but there's also true that governments have, through their bureaucracy and the lifetime civil servants, have an awful lot of consistency of purpose uh, in them. And the private um, companies are also have changing uh, directors and changing managers, and uh, uh, they can pivot uh, quite quickly sometimes, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they are pivoting in the right direction. So I think we have to be careful about how we judge the capabilities of the uh, public and private sectors. One of the things that I would bring to mind is that in the public sector, there is a lot more discussion about whether many of the big projects are really worthwhile. So I have no position on the relative advantages of the high-speed rail from London to the north, but it's clear that there's a lot of discussion about what makes sense and why, and um, there isn't the thought that, oh, we'll decide it and just go ahead with it. There is that thoughtful reflection on what is actually needed and how it will perform, I think is important. So um, I'm not saying that government is performs better. I'm saying that it's not an easy call to know whether the public or private sector is in general better at dealing with flexibility. Um, keep that in mind. It's just a thought. Thank you for your question. Um, another question by Carmen de la Sierra. A key component of economics is the time value of money. Would you say the sooner the flexibility is incorporated, the better? What is a good strategy to not jump the gun and implement a solution that was good in the moment, but it, did, it didn't turn out to be a good solution in the future, if the forecast is always wrong? Uh, thank you, Carmen. And... Uh... Greetings to you. I appreciate your presence. Uh, having gotten to know uh, your work uh, uh, over the last little while here at MIT, um, of course, we always can make the wrong decision. Um, I can decide, for example, that it looks like rain and I'll take my umbrella and then it turns out to be a sunny day and I forget my umbrella somewhere and I've lost it. So I made a decision looked right in anticipation, but was not correct after the fact. So it's um, always possible to make the wrong decision, to have regrets that you did or didn't do something. But I think the essence of flexibility is that instead of just making a decision now, way in advance of knowing what has happened, you can defer the decision until you got a lot more information. So in general, that having the flexibility to make a decision later on makes that it is uh, more likely to be correct than if you make it too far in advance. So um, we have to admit to the possibilities that things that looked okay at one moment turn out not to be okay for whatever reason, but in general uh, we want to defer decisions um, to the point uh, as far as we can to where uh, we can make a commitment that seems um, more reasonable in the light of better information. So if you have a 30 year horizon you're looking at, it's nice to be able to defer its decisions at least 10 or 15 or 20 years and not to make them for all time is the way I'd answer it. But even if you defer them for 20 years, you may find out that actually things didn't turn out in the, of the following 10 years. So it's not, you can't avoid it, but it is, um, um, it's part of life. Thank you for your question, Carmen. It's a pleasure to talk with you indirectly. Um, should I move to the next question or Michelle, would you have anything to Yes, yo, ask? please, please. Um, I would say, Is well, there? yeah, you can always use, use another, your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> There's another uh, yes. from Dennis O'Keefe. Picking up on Richard's point about the need for the hospital's SPV's uh, founder's consent, there are a number of these contracts moving towards expiry. Any thoughts on how such contracts need to be adapted to ensure that the net zero carbon and other sustainability issues are going to be addressed? Is there a need for the UK government, uh, for UK government intervention here? 
when these contracts were first first drawn, uh, these uh, requirements to move to towards net zero were not envisaged. envisaged. Um, thank you, Dennis. And um, I look forward to the possibility of uh, our having a, a more extended conversation offline and indeed with anybody else. We posted our email addresses. Um, and if you don't see them, uh, uh, Ilyas can provide them at some point. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the deals of the trust set up for the hospitals, I really can't say uh, very much about it because I'm not informed as to what's happening now. But the essence of the question, it seems to me, is that uh, times have changed and now we have an opportunity to do something else. Um, what is that else going to be? So we are now in the situation, say, 30 years later on, where the bonds have been paid off and uh, the trust is operating and it now is in the position of thinking about what will it do for the next 30 years. And it, it, uh, it has not provided for, presumably, uh, the capability to think about net zero, but it may be thinking about uh, either uh, extending the hospital, for example, having a new, a new wing or maybe a subsidiary located somewhere else. It doesn't have to be located on the same grounds. And indeed, whether or not it's worthwhile continuing the, the facility as it is or eventually phasing it out because it will not be the most sustainable one over the life. So um, I think that you are, they are in the middle of a game, if you want, the middle of the activity that's 30 years or so have passed and they need to think about the uh, further continuation with the idea of uh, flexible approaches. But uh, there are some things which just haven't been done that they hadn't been thought about. So I don't know if that is not a solution, but it is something I would just bring to you to the table to discuss maybe offline. Thank you for your thought. <clears throat> Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, another question by, uh, we'll probably pronounce this uh, name wrong, Yichi Zhang. Is presenting the achievements to the public an important part of the whole system? Or is sustainability and flexibility only for builders and owners? I can take oh. that one. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I would say that it's, it's all of this, correct? Because on the one hand, what we're after here is a change of mindset. We're trying to help people think differently about how they deal with uncertainty, trying to move away from basically finding uncertainty as something uncomfortable and, and something that um, scares us basically as designers, as engineers, as decision makers, and, and try to appreciate that it can actually help us move forward by considering other alternatives, uh, other solutions, that yes, I would argue are more sustainable in many instances. For instance, if you follow just the UN definitions of, of making better use of resources for future generations on the one hand, or resilience by trying to quickly reconfigure the system and recover the, pr uh, the previous performance. And if you're able to achieve that, then absolutely you should be able to reward, to display, to, to, to advertise these successes. And there are many instances in history of systems that have been designed more flexibly. And, you know, we've been using it in, in, in our courses and our research as good examples, but equivalently, there has been systems that have done, have been designed too rigidly. And, and even though, for instance, the technology was working, it was a complete failure from either an economic standpoint, but I would argue also in some cases from a sustainability standpoint. So it's not just for the engineers, the constructors, the, it's also to use these opportunities to contribute to the thinking for the next generation of engineers, I would say. Um, but thank you. I'm pick question. up a little bit on that, if I may. Um, yes. So uh, I think that uh, when you think about implementation, we have to recognize that in many cases, and we're talking about significant systems, that the public in some way is involved. 
if it's a hospital, for example, it serves an area and uh, people there are concerned. If it's a, a large airport, it concerns a country maybe. So, but in any case, so uh, let me give an example of this. That I was, uh, at one point, I was part of the group that was involved in deciding where the next airport should be for the city of Sydney, Australia. And there was a lot of discussion about what was the right solution. And faced with it, uh, we, as working with the uh, state government and the federal government of, of Australia, came up with a realization that uh, we really didn't know how traffic was gonna be developing and that the best thing given the uncertainty was to acquire a site uh, that made sense for the long term, and then to decide when and on what kind of airport to build there, if any. And that's in fact what happened. Uh, and right now they are building the second airport for Sydney on that site some uh, 30 years afterwards. And, but what was important about this debate, which had been going on politically for previous 10 years was our thought that we should really explain it to the public that, uh, and we positioned ourselves to have editorial op-ed um, statements in the uh, Sydney newspapers and the local uh, radios uh, to say, look, the fact is nobody knows what we're really gonna need. We wanna make provision for it, have the space, the capability, but not make a commitment until we know a lot more about it. And having that public understanding of the need to provide in principle for something, but without paying for the option, paying for the facility right away made a lot of sense, but it was, it was only successful after 10 years of argument when we presented it to the public and brought them into it. So I thought it was an example. I think it is an example of the importance of sharing the ideas so that you can have an implementation that makes sense uh, over time. Now, Ilias, I know the time's up, but there is a, a question from a, a wonderful Greek, uh, Konstantinos here, that I don't want to uh, miss, if I, if, we, if I may. So perhaps you can call upon that question. Okay. Um, so the um, question is from Konstantinos. Konstantinos. So I think that getting flexibility right requires a single agent to spec it out, operate it, utilizing flexibility and benefit uh, from it. Mega projects and public systems, however, have multiple stakeholders and are ridden with agency issues. How does this affect this paradigm shift? Um, I can try that and the answer of that if, uh, unless you want to go ahead, Michelle. Um, that's fine, please, I'll, I'll contribute. So um, I would say that one of the interesting issues is that um, if you are thinking about a big project in a company, as for the example, the ones we worked on with BP, um, is that uh, very often big companies also have a lot of different branches and so forth that are fighting for each other so that for example, we were involved, the group of us were involved with uh, the, thinking about the design of satellites that could be repositioned to uh, serve different areas for communication. And uh, it was all internal to the company and that was fine. But when it came time to think about actually doing it, there was an intense rivalry between the marketing people who wanted to serve a different market and then reposition the satellites accordingly, and the people who actually controlled the satellites who uh, could only fail. That is, if, they, if it went smoothly, that would be fine, but they could, if it didn't go smoothly, the system would uh, not work and they would be to blame. So they didn't want to be put in that position so that the, there was tension within the company that how do we go ahead and basically a large passive resistance. And I could cite other examples of that. The point being that um, there they are the, in general, that major decisions have a lot of participants, stakeholders, even if they are under the same umbrella, if you think, 
of the same company that very few places march uh, absolutely to a single agent that does it. Um, even the strongest dictatorships, uh, and I don't want to mention anyone right now, but the strongest dictatorships don't work that way. So um, I think we have to deal with, in our game planning, we have to think about the uh, possible uh, barriers to implementation due not only to outside stakeholders, but inside stakeholders. Um, just a thought. And I hope to hear more from you, Constantinos, when the yeah. time comes. It's a very good question. I'm glad to hear from you, Constantinos. It's also been very many years. Um, and, I, and I would add to this, Constantino, there's, um, there's, there's work on this topic done, for instance, at the University of Manchester by uh, Professor Nuno Gill. Um, but there is, in essence, um, a, a, common, a common good issue with flexibility. That is, if you're going for a show, everybody knows that we're probably going to be more comfortable if everyone's seated. But as soon as one stands up, then everybody's going to stand up, okay? And it's the same issue with flexibility. As soon as one of the stakeholders may not find that this is a convenient plan or so, um, then it might lose traction, it might lose interest. And, but there's a lot of effort in trying to identify the right context, uh, understanding the needs of the different stakeholders to make this kind of thinking a little bit more amenable. And, and I would encourage you to look at that. I'm not an expert in my, myself in that particular area, but I do know that this is, yes, you're pointing to a very real problem and there is work being done to try and address it, but but more from a practical standpoint, if not from a theoretical one as well. Excellent. Um, so I realize we have been uh, past uh, our original schedule, but um, we uh, managed to um, use this time to overcome the uh, technical issues we faced earlier. So thank you all very much for your engagement, for staying with us, for asking all these uh, excellent questions. This session has um, attracted great interest and your engagement is proof of that. Um, so uh, thank you once again for participating. Thank you to Richard and uh, Michelle. And uh, if you guys want to stay in touch and uh, I'm more than happy to facilitate the discussion, please uh, drop us an email um, with your contact details and uh, we can uh, um, facilitate this uh, discussion going forward. So thank you very much all for your time and uh, stay in touch. Uh, just to let you know a final thing that this uh, session is recorded and um, all of our sessions that we held uh, throughout the year will be, um, are, are, do have a place on, uh, on our UCL uh, dedicated webpage. So thank you very much everyone and have a nice um, rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I enjoyed the participation. Same here.